Awesome. Well, good afternoon. It's good to see you all. How many of you are visitors for campus days? Woo! Awesome. Well, welcome. How many of you are students or other kinds of visitors? Woo! Awesome. Well, good to see you all, too. Everyone who didn't show up who's a student, we'll talk next week. <laughs> You're in trouble. No, just kidding. Um, let me empty my, my pockets real quick. But uh, yeah, so my name's Daniel Bennett. I'm the executive director of academics here at Karis. I love Karis. It was 17 years ago that I was still in the Air Force, finishing up my time in the Air Force, and my brother came out here for campus days. And I was doing Karis by mail, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to Karis, but I still want to hear how my brother says campus days went. And so I can relate to you all. So I called my brother after um, campus days happened. He's like, it's amazing. You got to come out here. And so that kind of sealed the deal. So about 16 and a half years ago, I came out here. And uh, I've been involved with Karis ever since as a student and as a volunteer. And um, I served at other campuses around the world. And uh, I've been here on staff of almost 10 years now here in Woodland Park or in, in Colorado. And so uh, what the students know is that I usually start off with a story about my kids. Um, if you don't know me yet, you'll, you'll find out a lot about my kids as time goes on. Um, but anyway, so I don't know if you ever played this with your kids, but the other day I was playing with my kids where I was, I was in, in the living room and I would close my eyes and they'd try to run past me. And I was like, if I catch you, I'm going to tickle you. I don't know if you've ever played this. I used to play this with my dad a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so my kids, you know, they're like having that, that giggle fit, you know, where they're giggling because they're like, I want to run past you, but I'm afraid of getting tickled, but I still kind of want you to catch me. And so I close my eyes and I'm trying to catch them. And all of a sudden I have just this smashing pain in my face because I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. The two-year-old decided just to slam his head into my nose. So how many of you are parents? How many of you have had your nose broken or a bloody nose from your children? Yeah, see, that's what they don't warn you. <laughs> it's so much fun. But raising children is kind of like raising little bowling balls with hands and feet. <laughs> so you play with them, and all of a sudden, yeah, it's, it's so, I didn't realize how much of my life would be preventing them from headbutting each other or headbutting me. Or <laughs> Anyway, so for like two days, I had a headache, and I think they may have broken my nose or my skull. I don't know. Um, anyway. Uh, what was I talking about? Where am I? I think I did get a concussion after all. So anyway, one thing I love about Karis Bible College is that it's not about information. We have information, but it's about life transformation. You know, and, and I'll talk about that when, when you come in the fall. If you come in the fall, we'll talk about that more. But it is not just about learning head knowledge. It's about your life being transformed. This is not just for scholars. Our goal is not for you to become a scholar, unless that's what God's called you to do. But that's just one facet of the Christian walk. We want, no matter what your calling is, your life can be transformed by God. And so to me, that, that's what I'm passionate about and excited about. We call it academics, but really it's more about discipleship and transformation because we don't try to make this really hard academically. That's not the point. You know, Andrew says this often, but the real test is if you can live it, right? Who cares if you're like, I understand healing finally, and then you, you die, right? <laughs> Who cares if you understand it if you're not walking in it, right? And so same with joy, same with peace, same with victory in any area of your life. You know, it's not just the head knowledge of like, in theory, I know how to be kind. I'm a jerk though, but I, I know how to be kind, right? No, so to me, it's exciting to talk about life transformation. My favorite topics to share on are friendship with God and prayer and how to hear God's voice, you know, wisdom, how to mature in Christ, how to become all that God's created us to be. And so what I want to share with you all today, uh, the title of this message is, let me see, it's a really long one, the most powerful, effective, simple way for your life to be transformed. Um, and I'm going to do it, and I still want you guys to have time for food before the show. You don't want to miss the show. It's really good. So I'm going to do all this in 10 minutes. <laughs> now, so what I want to talk with you all about today is worship. I absolutely love worship. And again, if you don't know me, you may not know this, but I'm not a worship leader. I try never to sing loud enough to hear my own voice because it ruins it. You know, <laughs> like, oh, 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 my goodness. Turn up the volume. <laughs> like, I want to sing along. I want to feel like I'm singing, but I want to hear someone else. Um, so, so I'm not sharing this from a worship leader's perspective. To me, I want to talk about true worship. You know, the best moments of my life, and I've had many amazing moments in my life, the best moments have all involved worship. Now, singing can be a symptom of worship, but I'm not talking about singing. I'm not talking about music. I'm talking about something more than that. And so to get started, I want to back up and give a little bit of context. You know, Genesis 2, verse 17 says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So I'm going way back to Genesis. Carrie joked about it, but I do it for real. I always start in Genesis. So of the tree, right? So he said, if you eat of this tree, you will die. And they ate of the tree and their bodies did not die immediately. 
So what, something else happened, right? If you've been listening to Andrew for a while, you already know this, but they died spiritually. They didn't die physically immediately, but death entered their bodies, but they still had so much life, they still lived to be like 900. John 17, verse three, Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this very quick review or, or very quick context is that spiritual death is when we no longer can know God. Right, when Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually. They didn't die physically immediately. But humans lost the ability to know God spirit to spirit. Because God is spirit. We were only carnal now because we were spiritually dead. So, so we were, there's no way to have a direct relationship with God. So John 4, verse 23 and 24 says, But the hour is coming. This is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. So John 4, 23 says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, if you're spiritually dead, it's impossible to actually worship God. Because to truly worship God, you have to worship God in spirit and in truth. And if you're spiritually dead, it's impossible to worship him. See, in the Old Testament, people could do actions of worship. They could sing a song, they could make a sacrifice, they could burn incense, they could do actions of worship. See, they couldn't actually worship him in spirit and in truth because they were spiritually dead. See, true worship isn't an action, it's a reaction. It's reacting to God because we're spiritually alive and we're seeing him for who he is and then we're worshiping because of that. And so true worship is a reaction. It's completely different. It's something that we can do that people couldn't do in the past. It's absolutely amazing because he's saying, Jesus is saying, the hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. So having the truth, which will make us free, and having spiritual life changes everything. So the question I want to look at first is, why does God care about worship? And I'll dive in, I dive into this a bit more in depth in, in a first-year course that I do. I'm kind of combining a couple of things I share here in first year. But why does God care about worship? And so to me, the first thing to know, and we don't have to look this one up, but 1 John 4, verse 8 says God is love, right? So hopefully if you're here, you know that God is love. If you don't, you can look up 1 John 4, 8. God is love. But if you combine that with 1 Corinthians um, 13, verses 4 and 5, and I won't read the whole thing, but you may know this. It's called the love chapter typically by people. But if God is love, you can actually insert God into this, right? It says God suffers, or sorry, it says love suffers long and is kind, Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, and goes on and on. Since God is love, you could actually put God's name right there and read the same thing, and it's telling you what God is like. See, when I was a kid, I used to see this list of script, this scripture right here, love suffers long and is kind. I saw it as a to-do list for me. I used to look at this and say, this is what God wants me to do. God wants me to be kind, he wants me to suffer long, he wants me to not parade myself, he wants me not to behave rudely. But God gave me the revelation, no, I'm describing to you who I already am. And because I'm in you, I'm describing to you who you already are. So you can actually, different topic, but you can actually put your name in this, right? Daniel suffers long and is kind. Daniel does not envy. Daniel does not parade himself. Because this is who we are, you know, like Andrew said this morning, the word is a mirror reflecting to us who we are. But what God is showing me here was that He's describing himself. He's saying, God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. That goes against a lot of people's doctrine because people say, well, the reason God makes you wait forever to answer your prayers is so he can show off. God does not parade himself. God is not puffed up. God does not behave rudely. God does not seek his own. See, some people say God is love, but then when they describe him, they make him sound like an egomaniac. God's in this for himself. Why does God want worshipers? Because he wants all the worship. He needs it. He created all of us just because he needed a little bit more worship. And that's not what God is like. God is not self-seeking. God does not parade himself. So the question is, if God isn't self-seeking, if he doesn't parade himself, why does he care about worship? Why is he seeking worshipers? And so Acts 20, verse 35. Acts 20, verse 35 says, Remember the words, I'm going to jump to the second half. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If it's more blessed to give than to receive, which one does God prefer to do? He prefers to give. 
See, I used to think that God was trying to trick us a little bit. I, I, I thought I had good intentions. Again, I trusted him and loved him. But I was like, you want me to give because you like to receive. And God's like, no, you don't get it. I like you to give because I like to give and giving's better. I want you to be like me. So see, God's not motivated by receiving. He's motivated by giving. If it's better to give than to receive, God's not tricking us. He's saying, trust me, it's better to give than to receive. I prefer to give than to receive. And that's why I made you in my image so you can give more than you receive. That's what motivates us, right? So if God isn't motivated by receiving, he's motivated by giving, why is he looking for worshipers, right? Why does worship matter? And I already told you at the beginning with the title what my main conclusion is. But I want to back up a little bit and talk about praise. So to really understand worship, I just want to talk about praise a little bit. You know, praise is awesome. I love praise. I have nothing against praise. You know, praise is us telling God who he is, what he's like, what he's done, and thanking him for it. Right? See, praise is things like, God, you're so great. You're so holy. You're amazing. You're powerful. Thank you for saving us. That's praise. See, the thing about praise is that it's true even if you don't say it. See, if you don't say, God, you're awesome, he's still awesome. You don't make him awesome when you say, God, you're awesome. He was already awesome. You're just acknowledging and appreciating the fact that he's awesome. Thank you for doing this, right? He did it even if you don't say thank you, right? God, you're so good. You're so holy. That's true no matter what. And so that's, you know, praise is so powerful, but praise is true even if you don't say it. Uh, an example of this, Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 37 through 40. So Luke 19, 37 through 40, it says when Jesus goes into Jerusalem on the donkey, and it says, then as he now is drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God, right? So praise, with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, right? He's blessed whether they say it or not. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Right? Even stones can praise God because it's true even if we don't say it. Does that make sense? But worship is different. See, praise, even people can be praised. If you do a good job, someone can say, good job. You get an A plus, they give you a gold sticker. Good job. You, you did a really good job. You can praise a puppy, right? Good boy. Good girl. So praise, it's not a bad thing, but it, it can be even applied toward people, right? You can be praised, you can praise people. You know, praise is just something true that you're thankful for, you're acknowledging, you're appreciating. But worship is different. And the, and the story I like that really shows worship is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 38. Luke 7, 36. So it says, then one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. This is completely different. This isn't true no matter what. See, the difference is that in worship, you are the gift. You're not just giving him a compliment, you're giving him you. She wasn't just saying, God, you're great. She's saying, God, I give you me. I'm the gift. I hope you like it. It takes an amazing trust and vulnerability. You're saying, I'm giving you me, and that's completely different than praise. I'm just saying, I'm telling you something that's true no matter what. This is not true no matter what. If she didn't do this, it would not have happened. Right? So you look at the difference. It's one thing to say, God, you're awesome. It's another thing to say, God, I love you. One is true no matter what. The other one isn't true no matter what. If you, don't say God, if, you, if you don't love him, then you don't love him. See, one's a fact, the other's relationship. Right, so what happens to God when we worship him? Right, again, why does God want worshipers? Why is he seeking worshipers if he's not self-seeking? You know, one time I was, I was spending time with God and he spoke to me. Daniel, I didn't have to make you. I was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Same thing my dad tells me every day. No, <laughs> it's, uh, but he's like, I didn't have to make you. And I'm like, okay, I hope you're going somewhere with this. 
because that's not the most flattering thing. But he said, no, you don't understand. I didn't have to make you. I could have made everybody else. I could have made all the billions of other humans. I could have still had Jesus die for everyone's sins. I could still spend eternity with everybody else. And if I didn't make you, no one else would know the difference. But I would. I didn't have to make you. I made you because I wanted you. See, I used to think that it was more like a package deal. Kind of like when it's like, I want the fries and the burger, I might as well get the drink because it's cheaper. You know, or it's like, I don't want the cable, but I want the internet and the phone line or whatever. I guess the phone line, I should reverse that. <laughs> What's the phone line? Raise your hand if you've ever used a phone line <laughs> or a landline. It's getting, yeah, most hands didn't go up. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I used to think it's kind of like, well, it was all or nothing. God wanted all of us, but God's saying, no, it's not that I just wanted all of you. It's that I specifically wanted you. I could have done all of this without you and I didn't want to. No one else would have known, but I would have. And I chose to make you because I wanted you. Heaven would not, eternity would not be the same without you. I don't want to spend eternity without you. And think about the long-term commitment of God creating us, right? Some people may be scared of long-term commitment. When God creates us, he's saying, I want you for eternity. I will never get bored of you. I will never get sick of you. I'll never get tired of you. I want you for that long. It's absolutely amazing. And so when we worship God, it blesses him, right? He made us in his image. He made us with the ability to bless him for real. He doesn't just pretend that we bless him. We, we get to bless him for real. See, he loves us. He's crazy about us. He enjoys us. When we worship him, it's about the relationship. It's not like worship is the currency of heaven. And he's like, more riches, more riches. I just want more of your worship. I'm just going to hoard all your worship. No, it's, it's relationship. He loves your worship because he loves you. He's not trying to take from you. He enjoys you, and when you pour out your love to him, that's intimacy. He loves intimacy with you. He loves you when you give him you, right? Worship is when you give yourself as the gift. God loves that gift. He thinks you're amazing. He doesn't look at you and say like, ugh, did you keep the receipt so I can exchange this for someone else? <laughs> no, he loves you. When you give God you, he's like, that's my favorite. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted you, and I want to give you me, and that's called intimacy. So it blesses God when we worship him. It's not because he's self-seeking. It's not because he parades himself. It's not, because, um, or sorry, it's not because he's motivated by receiving. It's because he enjoys us and loves us. He's motivated by giving. And he loves it when we give to him and he gives to us. Right, so what happens to us when we worship God? And I've shared this story before, but uh, one time I was spending time with God again. And, and I never worry about it. I don't know if I was daydreaming or it was a vision or a combination, I don't know. I usually just care if there's good fruit and it really ministered to me. But one time I, I, I saw kind of a daydream or vision, something like that, and I was walking along the beach. This happened when I was living near the beach. Um, I missed the beach, sorry, what was I talking about? <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know, anyway, I shoveled like three feet of snow for 40 feet the other day. Um, I miss the beach. <laughs> so, anyway, I was walking along the beach and I just knew, I saw the ocean and, and I just knew this is the ocean of God's love. And so I, I walk up to it and I grab a glass and I drink some and I was like, this is amazing, I want more. But then you look and it's like, it's a whole ocean. So it goes from excitement to discouragement of like, how can I drink more? So it's like, well, I'm gonna walk out into it and drink more and more. And it's like, for, okay, forget the glass, I'm just gonna dunk my head in. And it's like, you know, I'm gonna swim out deeper and dunk my head and then just drink and drink and drink. And finally, I actually, you know, it, it turned to tears where I was like, tears of frustration of God, there's no way I can consume all of your love. And he said, stop swimming. And I said, but Lord, I'll drown, I'll die. He said, exactly. Right, see, we want to consume him, but he knows that what we actually need is to be consumed by him. Right, when you lose your life, you find your life saying, don't try to consume me. Don't try to add me to your life. Yield, give yourself to me, and you'll discover true life. Completely changes everything. It's about yielding to God and letting go and saying, I'm not afraid of dying. Again, in you, I'm, I'm gonna just let go and stop trying to just say one glassful at a time. I'm gonna add you to my life and see where it fits. Because again, the only way to consume the whole ocean is for it to consume you. You can't drink it all, but it can drink you. And so it's letting go and yielding to God, giving ourselves completely to him, which is worship. 
And that's the only way to receive everything God has for us is the, the act of worship, which is yielding to him and saying, I give you all of me, I let go. No conditions, no restrictions. All right, it's Matthew 16, 25 that says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, you can praise God and stay the same, but it's impossible to worship God and not be changed. When you worship God, you're giving yourself and he will never just look at it and say, that's, that's all there is. No, the moment you give yourself to him, he starts doing his work. He starts doing things inside your heart, giving things to you, removing things from you. Remember one time, I was on a road trip and I was, I was uh, again, spending time with God and all of a sudden, I, I saw this, this claw. You, you know those little claws that grab teddy bears and stuff at the store? It was one of those types of things and it was reaching down into my heart and pulling black things out. And I was like, what's going on, Lord? I don't know what's going on. And he said, there's shame so deep inside your heart that you didn't even know it was there. So you didn't even know to ask me to remove it. But because you trust me and you've given me access to your heart, I'm taking it out anyway. Right? It's kind of like if you have a camera. If you have a camera with a speck of dirt on the lens, when you look at the picture, it doesn't look like a speck of dirt. It just looks like a dark, hazy, blurry area. And God was telling me, that's what it's like when you have a hurt deep down inside. It doesn't look just like a tiny hurt on the surface. It just makes a lot of areas of your life slightly gray. And you're like, I don't know how to fix this. How do I get rid of this gray blur? He's like, no, don't try and get rid of the gray blur. Get rid of the speck of hurt deep down in your heart. And only I know that's there. See, one time God told me, when you're looking at your own heart trying to figure out how to fix yourself, your head's in my way. <laughs> look at me, and when you look at me, now I can fix you. I can change you. I can set you free. I can heal you. So again, the beauty of worship is that while I focus on him, he's focusing on me. We think we need to fix ourselves because we love him. And here's, I'm going to polish this amazing gift and give it to you when it's perfect. And God's like, no, you don't understand. Give it to me broken. I'll fix it. If you try to make it perfect and then give it to me, you'll never get there. You'll always be frustrated. You'll never be good enough. But give it to me. I love it just the way it is and I'll fix it. See, true worship is about putting ourselves on the altar. We're saying, God, I'm putting all of me on the altar, right? Everything I have, everything I am, everything that I want, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, right? We're giving our hearts to him, our minds, our resources, our dreams, our fears, our strengths, our weaknesses, our past, our present, our future, everything. We're saying, it's all yours, Lord. I'm going to stop beating myself up about who I was yesterday. I'm, I'm putting that on the altar. I let go of that. I yield. I'm giving you the good things. I'm giving you the bad things. I'm giving you my guilt, my fear, my condemnation. I'm giving you my dreams, my passions, my desires because I trust you. And that's the key, that the key to worship is trust. To give yourself to someone so completely, you have to trust them. If you don't trust them, you won't do it. See, there's nothing more beautiful in a relationship than trust. And the reason for that is that trust makes us vulnerable. If you trust the wrong person, they can hurt you. If you sit down in a chair that you don't trust and it's not trustworthy, you could fall down and get hurt. I right? see trust is amazing when, it, when the person's trustworthy. But see, with humans, we have to be careful. See, if I trust somebody in the natural, if I say, here's my bank account, and they're like, who are you? And I'm like, I trust you. <laughs> right? Like, why do you trust me? Thank you, right? So in the natural, we have to be cautious. But with God, once we get to know him, we realize I don't have to hold back. I can trust you completely. You know, and there's levels of like God earning our trust and finally you just reach a place where you say, you don't have to earn my trust anymore. You've proven yourself enough to me. I just trust you no matter what. I'm gonna stop questioning you. I'm gonna stop asking you to prove yourself every single time. See, trust is powerful. It allows people to give to us. So think about this. Imagine going to a restaurant and they say, okay, what do you want to order? And you're like, ha, yeah, right. I don't trust you to make me food. <laughs> then why'd you go there, right? If you don't trust people, you could never fly in an airplane, you can never drive a car, you could never do anything. You could never, um, let's see, stores, people, you know, anything, right? Marriage, you know, ima imagine a marriage without trust versus one with trust. See, when you have trust, it allows people to give to you and it allows you to receive from them. Same with God. If you trust God, why does God love it when we trust him? Because when we trust him, he can bless us more. Because instead of saying, if God says, I want to give this to you, and you're like, whoa, 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 explain yourself. Imagine having open heart surgery and you're wide awake and you're there like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, 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 hey explain yourself. <laughs> They'd be like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> There's no way this is going to work out. 
right? See, the beauty of it is we say, I trust you so much, I know you only have good things for me. See, God wants you to be blessed more than you want to be blessed. He wants your kids to be blessed more than you want them to be blessed. He wants your spouse to be blessed more than you want your spouse to be blessed. He loves you so much, and the minute you realize that, you say, you'll never ask something from me to hurt me. It'll only be to bless me. So you know what? Once you know that about him, you can just let go. And that, now that's the spirit of true worship, saying, I'm letting go. I'm giving myself to you because I trust you, because I know you. I know that you're good. See, that's the, that's the thing, is that in worship, we're giving God access. We're giving God access to our hearts. We say, God, I give you me. And he says, awesome, look what I can do with it. Now that you've given me access to your heart, look at the amazing things I can put inside of it. Look at the painful things I can take out of it. Look at the ways I can heal it. Look at all these things I want to pour through it. So again, by yielding, by yielding to him, we're letting him give to us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, this is my favorite scripture. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're beholding him. To me, that's worship. While I behold him, he transforms me. I don't have to transform me. I don't have to read a thousand self-help books. I don't have to do all these things. I'm not saying that it's bad to, to learn things. I, I work at a Bible college. <laughs> I, I love learning from others. I love iron sharpening iron. It's amazing. But the, the key is, while I behold him, he's transforming me. I don't have to tell him what to do. I can just say, I'm just gonna enjoy you and love you and pour out my heart to you. And while I'm doing that, you're pouring out your heart to me. And I'm changing effortlessly. I'm not trying to change. I just can't help it. You know, I had a friend once tell me, he's like, he had this image of us as meteors, like flying toward the sun or whatever you call that. And he's like, there, there's a stage where the, the closer you get to God, the bad things just burn off, right? You don't have to pull off everything or a, a different example, actually. So one time I was, imagine somebody covered in chains of darkness, Right, just completely covered in chains of darkness, all tangled up and tied together in knots. There's covered, and someone's like, I need to understand how to take all these chains off. I need to untangle them one at a time, one at a time. Tell me about your childhood trauma. Tell me about this. Did your parents not hug you? Ah, all these different hurts. This person rejected me. And it's like, God said, no, you don't need to untangle them. Just step into the light, and they go away. They're made out of darkness. Just step into the light. God says, just draw close to me and you will be healed. Draw close to me and you will be set free. You don't have to understand how it makes sense. Just understand that it's me, that I'm setting you free. So again, beholding him, we're beholding him in the spirit and we're being transformed. But if you combine that with Luke 11, verse 34. So Luke 11, 34 says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. So what this is saying is whatever you behold is affecting you. If you, so, if you behold darkness, it starts to get inside of you. If you start beholding light, it gets inside of you. Combine those two scriptures, what are we beholding? God's glory. We're not just being transformed into something lame. We're being transformed by the glory of God. That's what's affecting us and changing us and transforming us. And again, this is what worship is, is saying, God, I give you my, I give you my heart. I'm focused on you. And, and he just it can't help it. He just automatically is transforming us. So it's a place of the heart. That's why we can worship all day, every day. Like I said, singing is one of the symptoms, one of the common symptoms of worship. But true worship is a place of the heart where you're focused on God. You know, God showed me, one day I was walking to work. This is 20 years ago. I was walking to work and I was like, I don't want to go to work. I just want to worship you. And he said, who told you to take this job? I said, you. He said, then going there is an act of worship. Do everything as unto me. If I called you to do this, right? When I change diapers, when I have to clean up a mess of my children, when I have to do different things, that's an act of worship. That's not like, oh man, this is such a pain. I want to get back to worshiping you. This is worship because I'm doing it out of my love for God. It's overflow from my heart. And so that's a way that, you know, that's how you can spend 24 seven in worship because you're motivated by your love for God. Worship delights God, not only because we're blessing him, but because we're giving him access to bless us. Because again, if, you, if you're a generous person, right? Imagine you have children that you love and you want to bless and every time you say, here's something cool, they say, no. No, but you'll like this, no. You'd be like, just trust me. You know, again, whenever my kids do that to me, my wife and I look at each other and we're like, there's a spiritual lesson in this. You know, so I bet this is how God feels with us when we're like, eat the cake. What is that? I don't know what cake is. Trust me, you'll like it. I don't believe you. Trust me, you'll like it. And I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry <laughs> for all the times you tell me 
to do something or trust you in an area. And I'm like, I don't believe you. I don't think this is going to be yummy. He's like, forgive them. Forgive them? Are you kidding me? That sounds terrible. Forgive them. Trust me. No, they don't deserve forgiveness. Forgive them. Trust me. You finally do it and you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is life. This is amazing. So how do we worship? I'll try to wrap up here real quick. We give ourselves to him, right? Big things and little things. It's about giving ourselves to him in every way we can think of. You know, one time, um, this was many years ago when I was in the Air Force, I was playing an Xbox game and I got really sucked into it. And I started playing it in all my free time, hours and hours a day. And one day I just felt like God was saying, stop playing this game. And I kind of wrestled with that a little bit. Back then I used to wrestle a little bit. I don't wrestle anymore. Um, but I was like, ah, but Lord, it's not bad. It's not, you know, I was trying to justify it and stuff. And I was like, okay, look, if you tell me not to, I'll stop. And so I turned it off. I went outside, went on a walk, and I met somebody that then introduced me to a group of friends. And it changed the whole course of my life. And God said, it wasn't that what you were letting go of was bad. It's that it was in the way of something even better. I'll never tell you to let go of something to hurt you. And so sometimes God says, let go of this. And we say, but it's not bad. And he says, grow up. Only children think good or bad. It, all, we should only be considering good options. I'm not telling you to let go of it because it's bad. I'm telling you to let go of it because I have something better for you. Trust me. Let go and see what I'll put back in your hand when you let go of what's in your hand. So again, to give ourselves to him, we have to trust him. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, he wants us to trust him. It doesn't please him when we don't trust him because he wants to bless us. His heart's for us. So again, think about that. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's one thing to say, God, you're awesome, which I love to say also. It's another thing to say, God, I trust you. Again, we're back to relationship. God, I trust you. And that's worship is saying, I, I trust you with this. I trust you with that. I give you this. I give you that. You know, to me, I tell the students here often, you know, many times, you know, I'll spend time listening, I'll spend hours and hours listening to the word, listening to the teachings, but many times the breakthrough happens during worship because that's when I'm meditating on a worship or on a walk while I'm in prayer because it's about when I, not just hearing it with my head, but when I say, I believe you and I'm going to give myself to you in that area. And that's usually when the breakthrough happens. So the more we get to know him, the more obvious it becomes to trust him right away. Right, with internal things, external things, everything, right? With your circumstances, with your heart, with your emotions. Many times we get very fixated on external miracles, but some of the big, biggest miracles are internal ones. Where it's like, it's one thing, like, I need a car, God provided a car. That's awesome. But it takes an even bigger miracle sometimes to say, I'm free from my temper. I stopped hurting the people who love me. I'm free from my rage. I'm free from my shame. I'm free from my condemnation. Those are miracles too. It takes a, an act of God to set us free from these things and he, he has that power in him. So don't just focus on your natural body. God wants your heart to be made in his image also. So worship's about giving ourselves to him because we trust him. And the reason why God wants worshipers is because he wants access, because he wants to bless us. Imagine having a friend who's a billionaire and they say, and you're going on a vacation. They say, could I get the keys to your house? And you're like, why? And they say, no reason, surprise. If you have a friend who loves you and they're a billionaire, you'd be like, here's my keys. <laughs> and here's my car keys and here's my bank account. And here's, <laughs> I trust you because I know that you have the ability to bless me and the desire to bless me. So I trust you. How much more so with God when he says, give me this part of your heart. If we truly know him, we'll say, yes, and this part, and this part, and this part, and this part. I can't wait to see what you do. Remodel away. Knock yourself out. Transform it to where it looks totally brand new. I don't even recognize it. It'll be that awesome. And so, again, like I said at the beginning, this is my favorite way to be transformed because it's about relationship, not about our effort. It's about, God, I just want to spend time with you and love you and bless you and give myself to you like the woman with the alabaster flask or the oil, the oil washing his feet saying, I, I just get to love you and you transform me. It's amazing and it's fun and it's awesome. So I pray this has been a blessing. I really encourage you to stick around for the show because this message actually complements the show later tonight. Um, in a similar theme, at least in my opinion. Um, anyway, I love you all. Have an amazing rest of the conference. So thank you. <laughs>